the women's basketball team has won 12 straight and is in pursuit of regular season glory. And has the men's hockey team earned their keep at the top of the polls after a tough conference weekend? We've got all that and more coming up on Bobcat Breakdown. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Bobcat Breakdown. I'm Sierra Goodwill. And I'm Gabby Riggi. The women's basketball team has gone on, hit a 12-game winning streak after defeating last place St. Peter's 65-53 on Saturday. The streak has propelled the Bobcats to 12-3 in conference, good for second place in the MAC. Now, Sierra, what's been the X factor for this team going off on such a tear in conference play? Well, I'd have to say... The freshman talent as a whole has been a huge key factor in the wins for this team, but Erin McClure, you can't deny that she has, she's found her niche on this team. Before this win streak, she was averaging five and a half points um, per game. Now on this 12 game win streak, she's averaging nearly 12. She knows her role on this team. Her teammates are feeding off of her energy. She's been a huge key factor for these wins. Also the chemistry of this team, they're just clicking right now, um, enjoying themselves out there, putting an equal effort on the offense and the defense. But another huge key factor, I think, is the variety in this team's shots. They, in the beginning of the season, they were shooting a lot of threes, pretty much centered their offense around the three-point shot. Um, but now they're they're finding Aaron McClure down low, getting everyone involved offensively, and they've really just um, clearly been hitting it, their stride. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to agree. It's it's the willingness to kind of vary and center that offense a little bit differently. As you said, after last year with Jazz Martin, she could hit a three from anywhere on the court. So that was the way that they had centered their offense, was based and lived and died off the three. But when that wasn't working, their willingness to adjust it. Now they have Aaron McClure who's going to drive up, go for the layup. They've centered it that way, and as you've said, now that this, the rest of the team knows they have an outlet in McClure to go in down low, they have confidence that they can hit their, their points from anywhere, that they can go in and, and have that offense. And you could see that in their clean passing, in their term, terms of their communication. They know where their offense is centered, and now they're kind of relying on that, and that's the foundation they've been able to feed off of. Exactly, and obviously teams love to win. So they're winning, they're having fun, they're, their confidence is at an all-time high. So obviously this team has hit its stride, do you think that they can keep up the pace? I, I really think they do. I, I think there's a good group of leadership between the upperclassmen who were on the uh, undefeated team last year in the MAC, the team that went to the MAC title two years ago. I, I think there's that combination of the good leadership, and then players like Carly Fabry who are able to lead on the younger half, kind of cross that line between the players who have been there and know what to do and know the system, and, and the players who are still on, on the younger side of things, maybe – trying to figure things out, get that little bit of emotion, maybe under control a little bit more. So I think they have an excellent leadership. Trish Fabry is absolutely incredible, you know. Yeah, and it's not like they've been winning these games by the skin of their teeth, regardless maybe of that one Iona game. Obviously, that was a huge game. They were number one in the in the MAC. But this team is dominant. They're dominating teams. They're, they're not giving up when they're down. They're resilient. Their resiliency will be a huge factor in their success in playoffs when every team is going to bring their A game when they're coming to play them. The ability of them to come back from behind is going to be huge for them in the, in the um, tournament. Yeah, and I think it's their willingness to continue to play well. They don't get too frustrated. They don't get cold streaks very often, as we're going to talk about with the men's team. They don't really get cold. If they maybe miss a shot or two, they'll shake it off, go right back to it. As we said, they know where their offense is centered, and they can rely on one another to get it done. Definitely. The Bobcats are a win behind first place Iona and still the reigning MAC champion. So Sierra, how do you think this team, as we mentioned a little bit before, is going to do in the playoffs? You know, I have no reason to believe right now that they're going to all of a sudden go cold and lose what they've had. They're clicking, like we've said, on offense, on defense. Trisha Fabry has her team in control, in the spot that they need to be in going into the tournament. Um, I, I don't think that they will fall short of a MAC title. I see them going all the way. I see them winning this Thursday against Marist. I see them maybe – it's going to be a tough game playing Iona again the last game of the season. But this team, Aaron McClure, Paul Stratomy, all, all these key players are, are feeling it right now, and I, I think they're going to go far. Yeah, I'm going to totally agree again. Peg them as MAC champions. A lot of people were concerned, you know, they were a successful team in the NEC. Were they going to be able to make that jump? And I think they've been one of the more successful teams since Quinnipiac made the move to the MAC a couple years ago. I see no reason why they can't come and add another title to that banner they have up at the bank. Definitely agree. 
Another dominant team is women's hockey. It is the ECAC regular season champion and championship and home ice for the conference playoffs at the tip of its fingers. The Bobcats hosted ECAC rivals this past weekend. They defeated St. Lawrence 3-0 on Friday and tied Clarkson 2-2 on Saturday after Kaylee Mercer tied the game with just 56 seconds left. Gabby, how do you think they've rebound against that loss against Colgate? I think it was something we talked about a little bit last week, that it was kind of a necessary reset button. The team didn't have very many flaws, but I think, as they had even said themselves, that having that loss then was what they wanted as opposed to getting that one later on right before you hit the ECAC playoffs. I think of any team, Colgate was still a, a decent loss, and I think, as we heard Cass Turner say in the post game after the, the first game on Friday, it was able, they were able to kind of regroup, sit down and say, what's important, what are we gonna prioritize? They are a defense first team, they, they just had that opportunity to kind of reset. I think they look as good as they have all season. I, I predicted them to go pretty far in the ECACs. They're my favorite team on, to, to uh, go the farthest on campus for sure. I think, you know, that loss was just a, a ne inevitable. I mean, sure, Boston College is undefeated, but you can't have too many perfect teams in college hockey. I don't know if the no loss was necessary, but I know that this team is not dwelling on it at all. They It's behind them. Cass Turner is the master of being on to the next one, focusing on the task at hand. Um, the first line with Samo, Cianfrano, back together, Woods, they're just, they're playing tremendous hockey on both ends of the ice. Um, this They've already rebounded in my eyes. The Clarkson, um, with the tie against Clarkson, I don't think it was anything horrible that the Bobcats did. They had a great game. Um, it was just like a Clarkson's a great team, so it ended in a tie. But I think this team has already gotten back on track to um, get back to their roots and do well moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. After, in the post game, speaking to both Matt Rogers and Cass Turner, the two of them were both really, really pleased with the way their teams played. As Cass Turner said, it's a fun game anytime Quinnipiac and Clarkson take the ice. So that really doesn't surprise me at all. Now, with that tie to Clarkson, though, the Bobcats fell short of getting their ECAC regular season championship and guaranteeing home ice for the duration of the conference playoffs. What kind of impact do you think that would have having both home ice for this team and winning the conference title? Well, obviously, it would be huge for this team, and I don't think that it was too detrimental for them not to clinch it last weekend against Clarkson. I think they, I don't think they'll have a hard time clinching this weekend, getting two points against Union and RPI. I believe that they will win those games um, and clinch home ice, and I think it's huge because this team plays their best hockey here in Hamden, and I think that while the tournament doesn't really necessarily mean everything for this team. I think they're going to win the ECAC tournament, mark my words, but um, they, it's good to get that in that playoff mentality and be able to do it on their home ice. I, I think it's a little bit bigger. I think you're underplaying it a little bit, Sierra, but I am going to agree with you that they're not, it's not going to bother them too much. And again, uh, Union is still without a win so far, not only uh, in the ECACs, but on the year. So pretty good chances. But um, mm -hmm. There are definitely a few powerhouse teams in the ECAC. How do you see Quinnipiac doing in the playoffs? Uh, I think that they're going to, again, as you said, win the ECAC title. I think having the home ice is going to really help them. They've had a trial with the Clarks in the past two years, and you could see that effect that they had, that eight-hour drive all the way up to North Country, and then last year going from there to play Harvard in the first round of the NCAA tournament. I think being able to stay at home, being able to work out in your own, in your own room, knowing to be sleeping in your own bed at night, that's really going to help. I could see them, I think, I said on Hockey Night in Hamden that they could very well be a Frozen Four contender. I don't Definitely. know that I'm going to push it that far. We'll see how they look throughout the ECACs, but they have a very, very strong chance to yeah, play at home for the ECACs. You mentioned Harvard. I think they might, they might pose a little bit of a threat in the conference tournament, because just for the simple fact that um, it's hard to beat really good teams three times. Obviously, Harvard's in a little bit of a slump. I think Mashmeyer's an incredible, incredible goaltender. Um, who's kind of keeping that team in good spirits and keeping them still, having them able to be a powerhouse. I think if any team's going to sneak up on Quinnipiac in the tournament, it will be Harvard or maybe Clarkson, but I still see them going all the way. All right, I'm, I'm totally in agreement. On the other side of the break, we'll stay on the ice and discuss what can be taken away from the men's ice hockey team's road trip to the North Country, and we'll try to make heads or tails of the struggles of the men's basketball team. Keep it here. I could really go for a Rain Mike sub right now. Come to Rain Mike's and try our Philly chicken and cheese for just over four dollars. 
giant cheesesteak subs, and mouth-watering boar's head sandwiches for as low as $4.75. Q-Cash accepted just a mile down the road on Whitney, here at Ray and Mike's. As freshmen this year have stepped in and really just eliminated that problem, doing the right plays at the right time. I mean, it certainly seems like an uphill battle for this team, but I, Patricia Fabi is one of the best coaches at this university. Bobcats hosting Arizona State. We'll start with this power play. But she's strong. Good Lord, I saw her lifting one time. She can squat three of me. Like, oh, well, that's seven to me then. Good evening and welcome to Sports Pause. In the end, that we're here to win a championship this year. Jess Fontaine now has it back. She's going to take a ripper off the post, but she's going to come back. And my number one, hold your applause, Bobcats fans, is Quinnipiac. All right, Victoria, you know what time it is. It's top five plays of the week. My favorite time. Welcome back to Bobcat Breakdown. The men's ice hockey team remains at number one in the pairwise and USCHO polls after its overtime loss to St. Lawrence on Friday. It turned the tables on Saturday, though, with an overtime 3-2 win against Clarkson the next day. So, Gabby, it seems like the Bobcats sometimes struggle with St. Lawrence. Do you think it's an annual trap game, or do you think, the talent of the Saint, or do you think it's the talent of that team? Uh, I wouldn't say it's the talent of the St. Lawrence team. I apologize to the Saints, uh, but they're middle, low end at the ECAC, so I'm not going to call it at the talent. I'm still not really sure if it's uh, Quinnipiac is just having struggles and that's just kind of struggles continue, or if it's St. Lawrence in particular. This is something we've been trying to figure out since they lost to St. Lawrence the year they went to the Frozen Four in the national title game. And it may just be that St. Lawrence very well has their number, and maybe it's the first time they came in and underplay them, and then from there on out they just kind of got it in their minds that it's, oh no, it's at St. Lawrence, it's this game in February, it's that same time every year. Um, but I think it's a little bit of maybe it's just St. Lawrence has it and maybe Quinnipiac was just having another iffy game, mm -hmm. a little bit of an off game. But I don't know. I might, I might depending on what we see out of next weekend, it's going to determine how much more I feel towards is it they didn't play well or is it St. Lawrence is just that kind of back of their head that keeps bothering them. Well, I, it's my first year at Quinnipiac, so I can't speak on their past with St. Lawrence, but what I will say is I was beginning to see the Bobcats get comfortable in that number one position, kind of playing on their heels, maybe thinking that they could take a game off against these teams that are lower in the rankings. Um, but you can't get comfortable on top. You can't play on your heels. You can't, especially against a hungry Pretty talented team in St. Lawrence. I'm going to disagree with you slightly. I think it's both. I think it's I think it's a trap game, but I also think St. Lawrence is kind of an unrate, un, um, underrated sneaky team. Uh, Quinnipiac has been playing on its heels for a few weeks now, tying games that they shouldn't be tying, coming back for late comebacks. It was an ine I think it was in an inevitable for the Bobcats to eventually um, fall to one of these teams. I'll pull what Rand Pechnold says and that number one teams have a target on their backs. So I'll disagree with you a little bit there. But one thing that has been a little bit of a bright spot for this Bobcats team, Sierra, is the power play and penalty kill, both ranked third in the country. How much of a factor do you think these are have been and are going to be going forward? I think it's huge. I think Quinnipiac plays its best defense on the penalty kill, which is um, sometimes a little bit frustrating maybe to, um, for their team, for the coach, for the fans, because – this team has struggled a little bit on d defensively lately, but they're 90.1% on the penalty kill. Um, so such an impressive unit that this team feeds off of. They feed off the penalty kill, which is helpful when this team kind of tends to get frustration fouls late in the game. Uh, they head to the box late in the game. The penal, the power play as well with a 29.7 um, conversion success rate. It's just they're. The players like Sam Anna, St. Dennis, they're natural-born goal-scoring players. And when they're the extra men on the ice, they're going to find the back of the net. Yeah, absolutely. I think the penalty kill needs to stay good if they're going to keep taking undisciplined penalties. So I would love to see less of the penalty kill for sure. 
I think the power play is huge. I think Travis St. Dennis is such a key part of it, and a lot of people ignore him down low because they want to be chasing Sam Annis as he goes around the top. But I think seeing the way that the power play goal that tied that game against Clarkson to send it to overtime was Travis St. Dennis doing what he does best, mm -hmm. that one beautiful one-timer. I, I think things like the power play, seeing that they're able to convert They've had opportunities where there have been games where they had a lot of chances and weren't able to convert or went three for five on a power play. But I think special teams is going to be one of the biggest factors, that and goaltending going down the stretch. How close do you think this uh, the ECAC really is? Uh, really close. I think this is the conference with a lot of the best goaltenders, so I think that it's going to be really anybody's guess. Me too. I, I think goaltenders are going to be what keeps you in it. I actually think that the ECAC is top to bottom the most competitive league in the nation. Anyone can be anyone on any given day. All right, well, Sierra, we're going to stay in the boys' club after men's basketball left Diana frustrated, losing to the Gales 59-78 to on Monday night. Again, a second-half meltdown with Iona going on a 13-0 run, put the Bobcats down yet again. Sierra, what's the root of all these late-game struggles? They cannot close out games. This team falls apart in the final minutes of games. Tom, I don't know if it's Tom Moore. I don't know if the team's getting late game jitters they just need to drop that play to get them back in the game in late late in the second half to give them that momentum to be able to close out games to be able to get the win um, for let's take the Fairfield game for example the Bobcats were forced had huge momentum they forced double overtime but late game panic cost them fouls undisciplined fouls and they ended up losing 84 to 80 they just um, against again against Manhattan this team is so f so frustrating to watch because they have all the right pieces. They have everything that could go well, but they just can't knock down two point shots as well. They're one of the one of the lowest teams in the nation uh, from two point range. They just need to find their offensive consistency to be able to pull out wins. And if they can't do that, they're not going to find they're not going to find uh, victory. For me, it's what they do right when they come out for that second half. It was that Manhattan game was really frustrating because, again, they come out with these leads against Manhattan, against Iona. Iona went on a 13-0 run early in the second half. Manhattan went on a 12-0 run at the end of the first, or end of the first, yes, and then into the second half. That's what killed me is that when they hit the halftime, it's like they reset and hit a whole new game, and they just completely lose themselves. People weren't expecting them to come out this close with Iona. People weren't expecting them to come out this close against Manhattan. And the fact that you're holding these teams close and then it's dropping off as soon as you hit the second half is so frustrating. As we saw last night against Iona, they couldn't hit anything for a huge stretch of time. Iona pulls out with a 20-point lead. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just I don't know what happens when they hit the locker room at the intermission, but it's giving up these big – and. Long, long stretches, as you said, where they go ice, ice, cold. St. Peter's, that last three and a half minutes where they give up 15 points, just I, I wish we could figure it out. I think if Tom Moore could figure it out, they would be on a much different path. We'd be talking about a much different team. So what do you think needs to be done for a good max seating? Uh, I think they need to figure it out. I don't know what it's going to be, whether it's they don't talk or talk more during these intermissions. I think they're a team that kind of gets frustrated if there's a little bit of maybe a contested foul, they'll go off and argue with the ref instead of trying to shake it off and keep going. Mm -hmm. I think if they miss their shots, they're a team that's going to be like, oh, man, I, I missed that first one. It's going to be in their head that, oh, maybe I missed my first three or maybe I missed that layup. Like, I can't go forward again. If they get a lot of pressure from the defense, I think they need to be more confident in each other. I think there's a lot of times when they'll be double teamed or under pressure mm -hmm. by defense and someone like James Ford will really not know what to do when he's got a couple of good teammates and a couple of good options and down low. We saw that in, I believe it was the, the Manhattan game, where he would call a timeout because he didn't know mm -hmm. what option to go for with his teammates. And I think they need to have a lot more trust in each other and know that they're all smart enough with the ball to know what kind of play and know that there's an outlet for them. How do you think that they are going to do um, come tournament time? Um, I think it's going to be a little bit of a struggle. We saw that last year in that they, again, got kind of cold late in the year. They got a little frustrated. I don't know that it's going to be – a, a big vote of confidence for them going in. I think, like I said, if they can figure it out and they can get on a run going towards the end of the season, I think if they can solve these problems, they're a much better team. And I think they have the opportunity to be a really good team, but there's just issues they can't solve. I think it's frustrating for players like Abdullah Mundu, who you can see how much effort he puts on. He's sprinting in transition offense. I think transition offense is something that they are really, they're talented at. They're, they can get down the court quickly, but they can't, convert, missing layups, missing the basics. They just need to get back to the basics, get back to their roots to be able to move forward and start, start winning games. 
So when we come back, you'll see Q30 Sports' Pat Pitt sit down with the head coach of the baseball team, John Delaney. And as always, our Step Up and Sit Down Players of the Week. Don't move. Bobcat Breakdown we will be right back. I could really go for a Rain Mike sub right now. Come to Ray and Mike's and try our Philly chicken and cheese for just over $4. Giant cheesesteak subs and mouth-watering boar's head sandwiches for as low as $4.75. Cue cash accepted just a mile down the road on Whitney here at Ray and Mike's. Freshman this year has stepped in and really just eliminated that problem of doing the right plays. I mean, it certainly seems like an uphill battle for this team, but I, Cooper Crabby is one of the best coaches I've ever seen coach. Bobcats hosting Arizona State. Let's start with this power play. Coach, wrong. Good Lord, I saw her lifting one time. She could squat three of them. That's oh, more that's seven to me then. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to Sports Pause. In the end, we're here to win the championship this year. Jess Fontaine now has a shot. She's going to take a ripper off the post, but she's going to come back. And my number one, hold your applause, Bobcats fans, is Quinnipiac. All right, Victoria, you know what time it is. It's top five players of the week. <laughs> my favorite time. <laughs> While temperatures are bitter cold and snow keeps falling, baseball is just around the corner. Our own Pat Pitt sat down with skipper John Delaney to preview the baseball season. Thanks, guys. I'm sitting here with head coach of the baseball team, John Delaney. John, thanks for coming. Absolutely. Glad to have me. In your first season as a head coach, you had a successful campaign. You went 15-9 in conference play, 29-27 overall, an 11-win improvement from the previous year. Did you expect this season to come happen like this, or...? Yeah, you know, last year's season was um, had its ups and downs. Um, you know, we saw a young club that was still trying to gain momentum. So, I mean, early on in the season, we saw a lot of struggles. But um, I think we had a good blend of older guys that started to step up and show some leadership last year, and then some younger guys that started to gain ground midway through the year and started to take stride and, and show the ability that they had. So. Um, seeing the improvements, you know, 11 in improvement is, is what, we, what we expected. Um, I think moving forward now, you know, some of these younger kids are now juniors, uh, which was my first recruiting class, and now it's a chance for these guys to really take stride and, and take over the program. So success has been part of your track record here. Um, during your time here as a player, you made a dent uh, in the record books. You hold breaking some season records, single season records, um, and you stamped your name as the fifth in all-time hits here. Um, how do you transfer your roles of experience as a player into your role as a head coach? You know, I, I tell our guys, I mean, the biggest thing for me is, um, you know, I, I had some success on the field. Um, the way I did things, some things I did good, some things I, I did okay. Um, the biggest thing is the experience I think I got at, at the professional level is what really helped me grow as a baseball player. Um, and some of the stuff I learned, I never got a chance to really do uh, in my playing career, um, but I got a chance to learn and talk to a lot of guys that now I can take the research I've learned and give it to these guys and, and try to help them proceed and, and get better at their game. Um, and that's the biggest thing for me is uh, the development of the players. You know, I want kids to come in here that, um, that have great ability level but have a, have a higher work ethic um, and see them grow into good baseball players into eventual pro prospects at some point. Yeah. Um, last year in the playoffs, you played a small ball style, uh, more traditional style. Did that make a difference in the playoffs for you guys? You know, I think yeah, part of the, the learning curve last year for us um, was figuring out what made our team work. And that was probably more of a learning curve for myself. Um, you know, when I played, it was, 
you know, it was baseball was about being the guys that could drive balls in the gap yeah. and and let the, let the bats do the work. Um, and the game's changed a little bit. So learning a little bit last year what was going to make us successful was taking advantage of the speed we have and, and cause a little bit more um, havoc on the bases and being aggressive. And it turned into the fact that, you know, we used the small ball part of the game a lot more than, than was expected at the start of the year. Um, and I think that helped groom our team into a mentality of, team first mentality instead of player first and um, I think that's when the team really took off um, and started to produce as a whole was when we started to play baseball for the concept of <laughs> getting the win for the team and not about getting the three hits that day yeah. and that small ball concept started to click and that's when the team really took We'll have a full interview with coach Delaney on our website q32television.com later on this week. Changing gears here, we're in the thick of conference play for all four winter sports teams. So what's your game of the week? My game of the week is women's basketball versus Marist here at Lender Court on Thursday. It's going to be a battle for the first place in the MAC. I'm interested to see how Erin McClure will step up in this game. I talked about her a little bit earlier. Um, they played earlier on December 3rd where Marist won, this, won the battle 56 to 47. Uh, she only had two points in that game and I think she's developed grown leaps and bounds since the first time they matched up it's going to be they're not Quinnipiac is not the same team from the last time they faced off it's going to be a good one for me it's going to be February 21st men's basketball against Manhattan I think they had a really good game against Manhattan if they didn't have that first part of the second half issues I think there's a lot of film that they're and they had the opportunity to kind of rebound in this game I, I like to see it I think they have an opportunity to really come back and maybe actually come back and beat Manhattan this time and now another breakdown signature, the Step Up and Sit Down Players of the Week. There were some great games for the Bobcats this past weekend. Let's kick it off with our Step Up players. Gabby, who do you have? I'm going to stick with men's basketball and say Shays Daniels. He had a career-high 28 points against Fairfield, looked absolutely excellent, had 12 points versus Iona. He's had a lot of really big games. He's led the team in points a lot of games so far. Uh, I think he's really impressive out there on the court. It's been frustrating that they can't get a win on, on nights he's had career nights, but uh, Chase Daniels, props to you, man. Look at us giving the basketball teams a lot of love. My <laughs> step-up player is Erin McClure. I kind of sound like a broken record here today, but she dropped 22 points in the game against Iona. Huge game, one-point victory for the Bobcats. Um, her confidence is peaking at the right time for a freshman to be able to come in so clutch in these huge games. I'm interested to see if she can keep it going. Now moving on to our sit-down players. Who didn't show up for you this week, Gabby? Well, for mine, it's going to be a little bit more of a systematic kind of a problem, a little more endemic of what's going on with the team. We're going to say Kevin McKernan of the men's hockey team, sophomore defenseman. Uh, Ram Pagnell's is putting in a lot more of the younger players. You have guys like Chase Frisky, guys like Luke Shippo now coming in on defense. I think he's needed to be a little bit more of a leader. He's the only guy who's played at least half a season and is a minus player. Um, but I think the defense has been an issue overall, but he's one piece of a bigger defense that really needs to step up. My sit-down player of this week is Tim Clifton of the men's hockey team. He was a, he was a, <laughs> I know, right? He was a little bit of a mysterious scratch on the lineup against uh, St. Lawrence, but he made his appearance again on Clarkson in the overtime win, but he was, he did not show up on the score sheet. He was kind of a non-factor in the game, and it's, He's my sit-down player because of how impressive he was earlier in the season, and I think that moving forward in the playoff time, they really are going to need his presence, so hopefully he'll get back to his roots and show up for the Bobcats. Well, another episode of Bobcat Breakdown in the books, Gabby. That's right, Sierra. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for live game updates at QBSN and at Q30 Sports. And stay up to date on all of our latest content on theqbsn.com and q30television.com. For everyone here at Bobcat Breakdown, that's Gabby Riggi. I'm Sierra Goodwill. Have a great day.